The English opening, 1c4, has a reputation for being very difficult to play against from the black side, and studying theory on it seems almost impossible, at least that's the way that I've always viewed the English. So I thought that, considering I hate studying chess opening theory, because I don't want to spend all day just, you know, going through courses or whatever, if that's what you want to do, then go for it, but... I thought, hey, the English seems pretty strong, why don't I give it a go? And over the past week, while I haven't been recording videos, which I will explain in a minute, I've been giving the English a go, and with great success, I've played six Blitz games on chess.com with uh, English, and I won all six with an average accuracy score of 86% which I think is pretty mad, considering I know literally no theory whatsoever. I'm going to be taking you through all six games today, and trying to explain like how I was trying to set up. It's like kind of a setup-based opening, the way that I'm playing it, but I feel like I'm learning a lot about the English as I'm playing, and I feel like I'm actually able to play more positional chess, which is the kind of chess that I like, and I don't think it's reflected in the Vienna which I normally play with the white pieces. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video and maybe I can encourage you to give the English a go yourselves. If you want to skip to the first game, then the timestamp will be below. But real quick to all my subscribers, I want to apologize for being away for the past like five or six days. I kind of got a bit burned out. I've been posting daily videos since like the start of February. So it's been like four months and it got to the point where it felt more like a chore rather than something I actually enjoyed doing. And I don't want that because I feel like it came across on camera. So I decided to take a week off, like just under a week off, and kind of just relax a bit. Um, I did a lot of uh, fun stuff, so that was good because I can be a bit of a workaholic sometimes. And yeah, I feel kind of rejuvenated and I played a little bit of chess while I was off. Not that much, but the chess that I did play... Um, got me from 2000 Blitz Elo to around 2080, and like fairly effortlessly, I've got to say. And I think the English was a big contributor to that. I think um, it made me a bit less stressed when I played openings, trying to remember certain theory, because I could just play a little bit more freely with the English, I felt like. Anyway, I hope you guys can forgive me, and Chess Centurion is back in action. Whether I'll be posting daily or not, I don't know. I'll do my best, but I hope you can see the newfound energy back in my voice. And yeah, let's get into the games. I hope you enjoy today's video. So this is the first game that I played in the English, and I had no idea like that I was actually going to do this. I kind of just like started a Blitz game, and I was like, I really don't want to play E4 right now. I don't want to go into all that theoretical stuff. So let's just go C4. And my opponent went for a reverse Sicilian. So what I do now is I set up with G3 and Bishop to G2, because the, the whole idea, let's say we get some kind of position like this, the whole idea is that I have insane control over the d5 square. And I feel like it's kind of similar to the Vienna, in the sense that in the Vienna you have e4, bishop c4, and knight c3 typically. And all of these pieces control the d5 square. But they do it quite like close by. Whereas I feel like in an English setup, you get a similar sort of vibe but with a fianchettoed bishop instead, and of not having a pawn on e4, the e4 pawn is less vulnerable than the c4 pawn in my opinion, and the c4 pawn can be sacrificed if you want anyway, but my bishop is not like at risk of getting trapped with moves like knight to a5, which happens a lot when it goes to c4, or like forked with moves like you know knight e4, knight e4, and d5, which is typical of the Vienna. So it's kind of like a similar vibe, except you control the d5 square at a distance. I didn't, like, I didn't know exactly what I, what I wanted to do in this game, because, like I said, this was the first game I played in the English. So I kind of thought that I would set up in, uh, what is it called? There's a setup in the Sicilian, which I completely am blanking on the name right now. Um, ooh, sorry about that. 
completely blanking on what it's called, but the idea is that you put pawns on a3 and e3 and c4, and then put the queen on c2. I don't know why I can't remember the name of this. Wait, let me let me find it. Ah, that's it. The Taimanov. The Taimanov Sicilian. So I thought I'd play it in that style, and honestly, it's just because I saw Chessbra um, do like a rating climb speed run with it, and I got to this position, and I was like, I actually don't know how I want to set up right now. So I played g3 to go bishop g2, and I kind of just loved this setup so much uh, with, you know, g3, bishop g2, and e3 that and obviously the pawn on c4 that i decided i wanted to play that in future games on um like chess.com i don't know why i specified that but i wanted to play this setup in future games except i wasn't as fast about a3 and queen c2 so we get this position it's quite interesting i put the knight on e2 part of the reason i like to go e3 knight to e2 is to keep the bishop open which it wouldn't if the knight was on f3 the knight not being on f3 also means that e4 doesn't attack the knight. And I support the d4 square more, so I can potentially play d4 in the future, which e3 obviously also supports. And then take like a massive center in the future. And this kind of happens in the game. Knight f6, d3. d3 was maybe unnecessary. I maybe didn't need to do it, but it's not a bad move. I decided to go for a double fianchetto. Um, going for b3 was a bit inaccurate b4 was a bit better just to take more space but i felt like this was a very solid setup king h8 i castle i'm just trying to make sure f4 doesn't land with too much of like a blow here it actually does because if i go for this which is what i wanted to do then knight d4 and the computer thinks the black position is slightly better i think after bishop g4 attacking the queen i put the queen on d1 to defend the b3 pawn and it gets a bit messy from the white side, but it's kind of an in-depth line, and it is blitz after all. So my opponent doesn't see that. He goes queen to e8, presumably transferring the queen over to g6 or h5. I go knight d5. I throw the knight in the center to kind of like challenge black's um, dark squares. And then it also opens my bishop up, which further helps support the move d4 in the future. Rook c8, it was interesting because I thought he was going to take me and then I was going to play c takes to open up the c file for my queen. Move like knight d8, I could maybe take on c7. Uh, apparently rook c8, queen d6, rook c2. No, rook c2 I take on e5. So the best move is knight f7. Queen b4, oh and then rook c2 going for the fork but um yeah instead he goes rook c8 straight away rook ad1 was it's an okay move i should have taken on f6 apparently and after rook f6 which looks kind of scary to be honest i can then go d4 because i'm kind of exposing the weakness of the rook and d4 is often the idea in these openings anyway rook c8 i go rook ad1 because i just want to build further support for d4 which it eh, probably isn't necessary, but I didn't think there was much, like, of a time factor. Knight d5, bishop d5. I didn't want to take with the c-pawn, because now, after knight e7, my bishop's kind of tied down to the defense, and I don't want to go e4 to support it, because it not only blocks my bishop, but it also makes f4 more playable, and blocks my own bishop if he can get f4 in, because then d4 is also harder if I go e4. So... I decided it was better to take with the bishop, which the computer absolutely agrees with, just keeping this diagonal open and my options on in the center open. F4 is played, and it looks kind of scary, but it's not. EF4, if you take, then knight F4, and I'm just up a pawn, and the only way for black to try and justify this is to sacrifice the rook on F4, which is the best move, but white is still better because white has enough counterplay and we get a version of this in the game he goes bishop h3 first to force my rook to move queen h5 i go d4 which is the best move because i can't do something like takes because um i assume bishop f2 
or Rook F2, one of them. And I'm busted because, you know, I'm getting absolutely slaughtered on the king side. So I go D4. The point is that I have a ridiculous amount of support for the D4 move. And I'm trying to block off his bishop and also challenge this pawn. Because if he takes here, then the pressure on my king side is completely gone. And if I can just trade everything on the D4 square, I just emerge up a pawn. And with a very solid structure on the king side, my bishop can always drop back to a square like h1. I can offer a queen trade with moves like queen d1 or queen e2. I'm, I'm chilling. I'm just up a, up a clear pawn. But my opponent takes on f4, which the computer considered a blunder. Because if my game can work properly, I take on f4 with the knight. And again, the only way for black to really try and justify this is to take on f4. And it looks scary, like it really does look like I'm going to get checkmated with the way that the queen and the light square bishop are lining up against my king. But my bishop is patrolling everything. After queen g4 check king h1, black can't access this light square diagonal. And I'm potentially, you know, going to play moves like rook g1 to try and even turn the attack on him. Because I do have attacking possibilities in this position, like my queen looks over here, my bishop looks over here, my rook can swing over. If this diagonal was open, it would be crushing, but it's not. So yeah, he sacks the rook, he goes queen g4 check, king h1, queen takes f4. And here, I think there's one move that just wins the game for white, so I encourage you to try and find it. For me, I saw this move back here, after he took here. I had to calculate this out. Now I knew I wasn't getting mated here, but I wanted to try and just crush the attack where it was, just completely shut it down, because I'm up in exchange. And rook e3 is technically the best move, rook d3 is also good, just looking at this bishop, maybe swinging over to g3, and doubling on the g-file. But for me, the best move here is queen e4. The reason is, if you take my queen, and I take back, then I'm just up an exchange. Bishop g2 and everything is good, right? So, okay, what if you take on f2? Which is probably the most logical move. You go, oh, this looks pretty scary. Like, you know, a lot of things are targeted. Yeah, but I have queen to e8 check. And this is the move that I needed to see to make this work. And in my head, this is what makes queen e4 the best move. Because it's forcing. Black either trades queens or he tries to be greedy and goes into this line where the only move for black not to get mated is queen f8. I force a queen trade and bishop g2. I want to trade the bishops. If he trades, he has nothing. You know, his bishop's locked out. His knight can't go anywhere useful. His rook can't infiltrate. I'm going to offer him a rook trade at some point. So he refuses to trade bishop g4. I go rook f1. Obviously he can't take my rook because he gets mated. So he moves. And I played bishop g2 first because his bishop was controlling f1. So I wanted to force him away from that. Then I go rook d to e1. So I get on the e and the f files, the only open files. If my opponent again refuses a trade, then I just have everything in the position I could possibly want. He has nothing. And I'm just going to play moves like rook f7 and rook e7, and I'm going to win the game on the 7th rank. Black has no counterplay. So he trades, which is the best move, because otherwise it... I mean, it's game over, but it's even more game over. Then he goes h5 to give his king an escape square. Bishop c6, b, c6. Here you actually have to be a bit careful, because a move like d5 just blunders mate. So I... Not gonna lie, almost did this. But I saw this and I just go rook to e7, attacking c7. As long as I block this bishop off, I'm not getting mated. Bishop b6. Again, this is tempting, but you get mated. So I just go king g2, which isn't the most accurate move, but it means I'm never at risk of getting attacked because this bishop now obviously can't check me. And yeah, d5 is played, which is just bad, because c5, the bishop goes to a5 and gets itself trapped, and my opponent resigns. But if he goes to a7, like, it's still game over. I can just go rook e8 check and trap the bishop like this. 
So, yeah, my opponent resigns, and it wasn't the cleanest game, don't get me wrong, but it kind of exposed me to the fact that, oh, the English is actually viable. Like, this is actually a cool opening. So, let's get into the next game. Okay, game two, which is literally my second game, basically, ever in the English. Um, and, like, I'm playing good opponents as well, and I'm just beating them, which is kind of crazy. This game was very short. Um... We have c4 g6. My opponent goes for a Fianchetto setup. And yeah, here, you know, I've realized this is probably the setup that I should be going for. Again, just controlling the d5 square. My opponent doesn't take the center though. So I go e4, which isn't totally accurate because my opponent can play c5 to control the d4 square. And we could get a very similar sort of position if we get something like this. Where my opponent has a great grip over d4 and I have a very strong grip over d5. But this would surely be just an interesting game, right? Maybe I try and expand on the queen side, maybe I throw my h pawn down the board, maybe I go f4, looking for f5. That's not what we get. We instead get after e4, c6. My opponent really wants to try and make the move d5 work. So I go d4. Just taking the full center. And after d5, I went b3, which is apparently a mistake because of c5. It's blitz. You know, things aren't going to be perfect. And obviously I can't take because my knight hangs. So I probably have to go knight e2. Cd, knight d, dc4, exposing my knight. So yeah, it, it's, it's a rough position. But like I said, it's blitz. So after d5, b3, my idea was just to go knight g to e2. And if he was to take on c4, I just wanted to take back with the pawn. Because I know that our ideas, like just going knight g to e2 and sacrificing the c4 pawn, and it's actually okay, but I don't know enough about it to be comfortable to go into these types of positions. So, you know, you can go for moves like a4 to stop b5 or try and go like e5 at some point to get the bishop out i don't know how these work and like i said i don't know the theory i don't want to know the theory i just want to play simple chess that gives me a position where i can try and outplay my opponent that's the whole point so okay yeah i'm still learning i play a couple stupid moves but my opponent goes knight f6 which i just thought was idiotic because i was like e5 and your knight can't come forward if you come to g4, then I'm just going to boot you out. You go to h6, and your knight's just offside. Like, it's not going anywhere. g4 cuts out the f5 square, and where are you going? Like, back to g8? Which, by the way, the computer thinks is the best idea. <laughs> like, this is miserable. I'm going to completely crush you. So he goes back to d7, which I suppose potentially opens c5 as an option, which kind of happens in the game. I go bishop a3, which I was very happy about. Because my point is, I'm shutting down c5, kind of. But it's also, I've got a lot of pressure on this knight. And this diagonal is very weak because my pawns helped control the squares very well. My opponent goes f6. He tries to break out of the position, which is a good idea. I go f4, just to give e5 even more support. We have takes, and I take with the d pawn. I didn't want to take with the f pawn. Because I thought after he castles, his rook gets the open file, and now I can't castle. I also didn't want c5 to undermine my center. Because if he undermines d4, then he undermines e5. So I take with the d-pawn instead, so that... Because f4 is secure, he's not going to play a move like g5 to try and undermine my f-pawn, right? So now this is nice and safe. And if he goes for a move like c5, then that means that d5 will be way too weak. Because like I said, the whole point of the English is all the pressure you have on d5. At least that's how I understand it. So obviously I would just, you know, win the d5 pawn in this situation. So it, my point is it becomes very difficult to block off this diagonal. So we have castles, castles, rook f7. Just to remove the pin and guard the knight, I go knight d4, looking at the e6 square. And I expected my opponent to play knight f8, just to add a bunch of defense. And don't get me wrong, my position is very, very powerful. I can move, play moves like bishop d6. But I didn't see, like, an obvious way forward. Yeah, but that's not what my opponent did. He goes knight b6, 
opening up the defense of the pawn with the bishop and putting pressure on c4. And you might say, oh, well, that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, but this just loses. The computer says plus 1.2. It's basically losing, like, positionally. And I assume most of you have seen the move at this point. Um, if you haven't, then I'd encourage you to try and find it. But the move is c5. And this seems kind of counterintuitive because you block off your bishop. But the problem for black is that he only has one square to move to with his knight. And that blocks off the bishop's defense of e6. And then I just take the pawn, attack the queen. Queen a5 does attack both my knight and my bishop. But I can play, I think um, knight b1 is the best move to defend the bishop and get the knight out of danger. And I maintain enough defense of c5 so that he can't take it. And then I can probably go b4, kick the queen out somewhere, and then c5 is nice and secure. So I was very happy with this game because I didn't play the opening perfectly, but I think I got the general gist of the English. Um, just like putting the pawns in the center, having the knights supporting the pawns, and then the bishops coming from a distance rather than being like in the mix of it. Um, so I, I was very happy with this and yeah my opponent made a bit of a stupid mistake with knight b6 but that only really like comes to light if I have a bunch of pressure on him which I did like I had so much pressure going on and that's why this worked typically if you have a good position tactics work in your favor game three game three I hope you guys are enjoying this by the way and maybe some of you are considering the English especially because I don't know any theory so I don't think you need to learn theory. I think you can just play intuitively and try and dominate the center and, you know, just have fun with it, honestly. I think it's more fun without theory as well because you're not, like, having to remember. You're just, like, coming up with creative ideas instead. And if you are enjoying this video so far and you're not subscribed to the channel, what are you doing? Subscribe to the channel. You know, you, you know you're enjoying this if you're already, like, 22 minutes in. Don't be kidding yourself here. So this game, c4, e5, we get another reverse Sicilian type position. Knight c3, bishop c5, which is a bit of an odd setup. But my opponent goes for like a bishop's opening type thing. Kind of similar to the Vienna, if you have like knight c6. But yeah, he goes knight e7. I go e3, which blocks the diagonal off and sets up knight e2. And this is kind of the setup that I adopted for the rest of the games, right? c4, knight c3, e3, knight g to e2, g3, and bishop g2. You can call this a setup-based opening, and I'm not going to argue with you. But again, the point is we control the d5 square. We have decent control over d4 to try and make d4 happen in the future. But for the most part, we're kind of just going to chill and try and squeeze black. So castle, castle, bishop g4. Bishop g4 I thought was kind of odd. And I should just challenge it with h3. Because if you take, then like, why are you just giving me your light squared bishop? My bishop is now absolutely amazing. And you're never playing d5, by the way. I go a3. Because I figured that the bishop and knight are a bit vulnerable to moves like b4 and b5. And also, once I advance my b-pawn, I can put my bishop on b2. And I quite like this double fianchetto sort of position. And you'll see why. My opponent goes a5 to stop me. Again, I should go h3. But I go I go queen c2. And I really shouldn't do this. Because then bishop f5 comes with tempo. But that also is kind of like black admitting his bishop was misplaced. So after queen c2, my opponent goes queen d7. I go rook e1. Just defending the knight. Which is probably unnecessary. But okay. I should just be playing h3. Uh, beforehand f5 is played I then go f4 which looks a little bit weird but my point is if my opponent takes then apparently gf4 is the best move I was going to take with the knight though and g5 is the best move for black but that looks very unnatural to me I don't know if you disagree but my point was that I'm going to play d4 and yeah e3 looks kind of weak but let's just say black plays a nothing move like rook ab8 then I can put a knight on d5, I can go d4, it's all very nice. Like something like this maybe. Just looks like a very nice position, very comfortable. 
with the white pieces. And his bishop is a bit misplaced. I can maybe play moves like h3 to try and kick it out. Although, does that not just work here? Oh, it does. Uh, but unless black plays g5, which is kind of weakening anyway. The point is if I take, then take. Which is probably good for black. I mean, it's fine for me, but probably good for black. Because this looks kind of scary with all the kingside pawns getting removed for me. My opponent goes e4, though, to lock the position up. I go knight a4, which is a mistake, but my idea was to attack this bishop. Bishop a7, which is the most natural move, and then go c5. And my point was that if my opponent takes, knight takes, then his bishop's block kind of blocked out. Because if I move the d3 pawn, like the pawn to d3 to challenge e4, which is what I wanted to do, I was worried e3 would become quite weak. Which is why I wanted to block out his bishop. Apparently, you just take and then, what, go a4, I guess go like knight a5, knight b3, which makes sense. Black tries to squeeze the white position on the light squares. But my opponent didn't do that. After c5, he went d5. And here I was very happy because his bishop really is going to struggle to get out at this point. I go d4. And if black doesn't take on Poisson, if he doesn't take on Poisson, then okay, he's a little bit better maybe, but uh, that's what the computer is saying. For me, I feel like I lock down the king side and I lock down the center because this pawn chain is kind of unbreakable. The only real way through is probably g5, which is risky. And then I can probably turn my attention to the queen side and go for moves like b4 to try and break through. I thought this would be quite a nice setup. My opponent takes on Poisson though. And after queen d3, yes, the e3 pawn is backward. But again, his bishop can't get out. And I have a good amount of pressure on d5. I might rotate this knight to c3. I might fianchetto this bishop and then bring this rook in. I thought this was quite a nice position. Rook a d8 just defends. I go knight to d4 because I don't want my opponent to be able to push the pawn and get rid of his weakness. Knight d4, e d4. And I could have taken with the queen, but I wasn't a massive fan of doing this because I, again, have this weak e3 pawn. So after the trade, I take with the e-pawn because now the e-file is the only open file. And in my mind, I thought that I can dominate it because I'm already on the file. c6, bishop d2, I'm, you know, putting pressure on a5. Queen c7 defends a5. And then rook e6, which I was very happy with. Because I want to put the rook somewhere on the e-file. And it's actually really difficult to kick the rook out of e6. Because this knight can't kick the rook out. The bishop would have to spend two moves moving. But if bishop h5, I have time for rook a to e1. And then you can't get bishop f7 because I take your knight. And I can always retreat the rook if I want to. b6 is also kind of shut down because my knight is helping in the defense of the b6 square. And if you do go b6, then c6 might become weak and my rook is ready to pounce. So after rook e6, my opponent goes to knight c8 to get the knight out of the way. Rook a to e1 to stop him from challenging me. My opponent goes b5 and I could take this. But I decided instead to go knight c3. Because in my mind, this meant the bishop was locked out forever. And if the bishop goes to b8, it's still locked out by the f4 pawn. And yes, my bishop is also kind of locked out, but I can put pressure on a5, and his bishop can't defend a5 that easily, unless it goes to b8 and then c7. But that would require the queen to move as well, which takes a lot of time. So my opponent does go bishop b8. I go queen e4, sorry, queen e3, which apparently knight d5 was the best move. And then going like this, winning two pawns, pressure on a5, pressure on d5, my rooks are still good. Uh, I didn't see this. I go queen e3 just to set up a massive battery. b4 was unnecessary. I don't understand why my opponent did this. I was kind of baiting him into doing it. I wanted him to do it. Because the idea was for me that I could go knight a4 and then potentially go to b6 if his knight ever moves. And if his knight doesn't move and we get this kind of position, then I keep the queen side locked. That was my point. I just keep it all locked down because I want to try and play in the center. 
because this bishop this bishop's stranded this bishop isn't doing anything this knight is stuck defending b6 because otherwise i'm gonna put a knight there he can't challenge me on the e file and now i just need to try and configure a winning sort of position so queen b7 looks to try and get on the b file but i realized i basically control every square on the b file i control b1 i control b2 i control b3 i control b4 I control b6, but I don't control b5, which is why I played bishop to f1, to control b5. So every single square on the b file is unusable for the queen, and therefore it poses no threat. Also, I can't go to a6, because I control that square. So bishop h5 looks to probably try and go to f7. I go bishop a5, I just win the pawn. Now, if my opponent tries to defend with a move like let's say queen a7 in this position then c6 hangs if you go for a move like bishop c7 to try and defend that's probably a bit more of a stubborn way to play it but i can just keep improving with moves like bishop d3 just looking at f5 maybe i can go bishop e2 to try and trade but i feel like it's a bit less obvious how i break through this position with white maybe i go queen d3 and queen a6 or bishop d3, rook b1, but that's not what my opponent does, he lets me get the pawn, I attack his rook, rook d to e8, his bishop now supports this, so he can actually go for it, I don't want to take him, because after rook e8, I can't really take, because uh, the bishop defends, so probably a move like queen f2, and I'm good, but I felt like I wanted to just dominate the e-file, so I go knight b6, because now I have enough support for it, and if he takes my rook, then after queen takes, he doesn't have rook e8 in time because this comes with a check. So if he moves the king, then I can go for queen d7, offering a queen trade. And the a pawn is going to run. And I, again, keep control of the e file. Or if a move like bishop f7, then I just win this pawn. And he has no useful discoveries. So my opponent goes knight b6 instead. I take back with the bishop, which was a mistake. I should have taken with the pawn, because now I have connected past pawns, and I guess c6 is still, you know, under fire. The queen can't really do a whole lot. It's just stuck blockading. But my idea was, after bishop b6, that if I can go a4, a5, a6, a7, my bishops are kind of, like, monitoring the pawn's way in. So that's why I go for that. Rook e6, queen e6, king h8, and the problem is black just can't do anything. So I go queen e7, which was kind of unnecessary. I could just push because rook e8 would get checkmated because the king has no way out. So I go queen e7 though, because I'm up a pawn. And being up a pawn isn't that important, right? Obviously it's good, but it's not winning necessarily. But the point is that the a pawn is running. I, can, I dominate the e file. So if my opponent trades, which he does because he doesn't really have anything else, his pieces are terrible. This bishop has no future. This bishop, I mean, where's it going? Maybe to like e4, but then what? The rook can't challenge the e-file very easily. And again, the problem of this pawn and c6 being weak. My opponent goes g5 though, which was a very practical idea. And after fg5, which I kind of have to do, my opponent goes f4. I take, bishop takes f4, and now he kind of has some counterplay. But it's not enough. And now I go a4, which is actually a blunder. Because he can just take on g5. And the computer thinks that he's hanging on to the position somehow. But apparently, the what was the best idea? Basically anything else. Bishop c7 was a good one, apparently. Because if you take, I assume I go bishop e5 check. If bishop f6. Then I start pushing. I guess the dark square bishop poses a bit of a threat to me. And if he moves, then I just have rook g7 and he's getting mated. So, yeah, I'm a bit annoyed I blundered that. But my opponent, he does take. I go rook e5, which this is the best line. But then he needs to go rook g8 to defend his bishop. And also potentially have discoveries on my king. He doesn't. He goes h6. And this allows the winning move in this position, which again, I think it might be kind of obvious, but I would encourage you to find it. The move is h4. 
and the bishop's under attack and the bishop has no checks because I control that square and if you take then I take your bishop and that and my opponent retreated to f6 and allowed me to take so that he could take on d4 with check king g2 rook f2 king g3 and he does win the piece back so fair play but the issue is that I take on h6 and I had to see this position from back here to make h4 work but I figured I was just winning too many pawns and I'm t I'm up two pawns but I have three pass pawns and uh, the a pawn is the issue really and the c pawn and the fact that d5 is so weak so bishop e5 king g4 rook f4 king g5 I just keep advancing and um, he has no more checks to give his rooks under pressure d5 is kind of weak the a pawn's just going the c pawn's going the h pawn is also going because my king is now shepherding the pawn rook a4 is played he does win his one pawn back but h5 and sometimes being at one pawn isn't enough but here it is because they're so close to promotion bishop f4 check king f5 again i make sure i don't get like discovered checks on me and i keep pressure on the bishop bishop h6 rook g6 king h7 and the bishop is you know under threat i go c6 i keep pushing rook f4 king e6 king to e5 here i'm threatening rook h6 king h6 and king takes f4 so my opponent moves his rook but i just go c7 and it doesn't matter that you win this and even if i went to like d6 oh that would allow bishop f4 actually let's say i go to e6 it doesn't even matter that you can take my rook because i can just queen but it's obviously more accurate to just defend the rook. And my opponent has no good way to stop me from promoting. Bishop g5, I just take it. And obviously if you take, I can just take and then I can promote. So yeah, this was kind of game over. He does find a way to defend the pawn, but it's not good enough because I, I can obviously promote and just win his rook. But I decide to build a bridge instead to make sure that I promote to a queen. And then the rest of the game is kind of just walking my king in and checkmating him. I kind of just kept my bishop out of it because I didn't want any stalemate tricks. But uh, yeah, that was game three. Very solid game. And let's get into game four. Okay, so at this point I'm pushing like towards 2100. It's getting pretty good. And obviously I am also playing games with Black where I'm playing the Karo and the Slav with pretty good results. Um, I think I only lost one of them in like, I don't know, six Karo and Slav games. So that was going pretty well as well. But anyway, yeah, we get the setup. My opponent goes for this, yeah, sort of Karo-esque position. Again, I know you can play moves like bishop g2 and sack the pawn, but I don't know enough about it, so I'm not going to risk it. I'm just going to trade, go bishop to g2. My opponent could take the full center, but I don't know. As a Karo player, I know I probably wouldn't. If I was in this position, I'd probably go for moves like bishop to f5 and d6 maybe, just to get a familiar setup. He goes e6 straight away. I go for a double fianchetto. And my opponent goes for a weird sort of Dutch defense position. And I figured, okay, let's not go straight at him. If he wants to go e5 and take the full center, go for it. I believe in my position. I'm going to put my rook on the c file. I go f4, which is a mistake actually because of knight g4. And I think I saw this after I played it. And I was like, please don't see knight g4. Because I can't stop the knight from getting to e3. Apparently the best idea is to sack my rook and then go like this. Oh, because otherwise my queen gets trapped. <laughs> so like if I go h3 here, my queen's just trapped. So yeah, my point was just to defend e5. And it's kind of like an English, but in reverse. Because normally I have a pawn on c4, a bishop on g2, and a knight on c3 to control d5. But here my idea was to put a pawn on f4, a bishop on b2, and a knight on f3 to control e5 kind of like a reverse english sort of setup or like a mirror english anyway thankfully my opponent misses it he doesn't even spend any time thinking we go knight gf3 
queen d7. I go h3 to stop knight g4 because I realized how big of a problem it is. b5, castle, bishop b7. And here I was just quite happy with my position. I shoved my knight into e5. We get a trade. Taking with the f-pawn was a mistake, apparently. Taking with the bishop's better to keep the diagonal open. But I take with the pawn. And my idea was to try and potentially make e4 work at some point. Um, and then have this pawn just as a fawn in black side. But knight h5 attacks g3. I go king h2 to defend g3. f4. And this position got really interesting because I did not want to take this. Because knight f4, I didn't like the fact that my king's defences were getting removed and he was attacking my bishop. I did not want to give him my bishop. So if I go for a move like bishop f3 so that I don't, you know, moves like d4 can be kind of annoying, forcing the bishops off the board. So instead I just went g4. I went, you know what, put your knight on g3. But it's not doing anything. It's not getting anywhere. And I will put pressure on f4. Bishop h4 is played. I go knight f3. And the bishop has to either retreat or get defended. And here I was just like, whoa. This pawn structure can't be good in front of his king. This must like come back to bite him at some point. Here, bishop h a3 is the best move to attack the rook. And if rook f7 maintaining defense, then queen d2 attacking the pawn. I went queen d2 straight away to attack the pawn. I don't see what the difference is, to be honest. I think it's basically the same position. Uh, anyway, yeah, my opponent needs to go d4 to offer a bishop trade for some reason. And then bishop h, sorry, bishop a3, rook f7, we get the same position and the pawn will hang. So I don't see what the difference is. My opponent goes rook a c8 though, and I take and queen takes, and then I go bishop h a3. My point was, if I take on f4 first, I was worried about queen c2. I guess I am actually just fine, and his king is in big, big trouble. But I decided first to go bishop h, sorry, bishop a3, which is just as good. Rook f7, and then I take, and we get the same position, except I just get an extra move with bishop to a3 in place. Knight e2, kind of just loses to queen g5, and after king to h8, oh. Wait, <laughs> I was going to say find the winning move, but um, yeah, that is the winning move. Obviously, a lot of moves in this position are winning, but bishop e7 just ends the game because this is mate. And if you go h6 to give your king a square, then this is mate. And you can't defend yourself because if you play a move like queen g8, then you're mated. So, yeah, I thought this was quite an interesting game. I didn't, it wasn't like a pure English but it kind of like made me realize that even if my opponent plays in a very weird way, he played like a Dutch Caro sort of thing, then this double Fianchetto setup is still very viable. And I can still get some nice positions without knowing theory. And for me, that was kind of the most important thing. I don't want to know a ton of theory. I just want to play chess. Anyway, I decided I'm going to skip one of the games because um, it was kind of just a mess, to be honest. <laughs> And also, though, I'm aware this video is getting long. So let's get into the final game. If you're still still watching the video, then I really appreciate you guys. And, you know, I did, I did miss making videos. So we're back. Let's get into the last game. Okay, this game I literally played this morning. And this had like 94% accuracy. And it was kind of a short game. But I think it's kind of like showing the advancements that I'm making in understanding the English because I feel like I played this pretty perfectly. We get this whole setup, right? Knight on c3, pawn on c4, bishop on g2 to control the d5 square. My opponent goes for a king's indian setup and I just stick to my setup with e3, knight g to e2. My opponent goes e5 and I castle. I can go d4 but I feel like there's no rush. If my opponent goes c5 to try and make it really difficult for me to, I think I can anyway. And let's just say everything gets traded, then d6 is incredibly weak. So knight c6, I go b3, which is actually the best move. Um, again, I can go for this, but my opponent is playing a king's Indian 
that's what he wants. He wants me to go for a move like d4, and let's say, uh, I don't know. I mean, if he takes, then, you know, it, his bishop opens up. And let's just say he plays a waiting move like h5, just for sake of argument. Then he's going to get this kind of position, which I used to play the King's Indian. I know this is typically what black wants. Maybe not with a pawn on h5, but you get my point. So I just don't allow it. I just feed in Kesso my bishop. And I see this bishop go to e6, which I, I really was happy about. Because that meant after queen d7, he's kind of threatening bishop to h3. I put a knight on d5, because you can't take, because you get forked. And that's why I wanted to see the bishop on e6. So I put the knight on d5, bishop h3. And, you know, it looks like you can take, take, and go knight to c7. But then you just lose after knight g4, and you're just getting mated. So I didn't do that. After queen h3, I take the knight. Bishop takes, and I go knight c3. And my point is, this queen looks scary, but there isn't actually a way for black to break through. And my control over d5 is going to become very apparent once I put a knight there. My opponent should just retreat his queen or retreat his bishop. I, but I don't know, these are kind of counterintuitive moves. Maybe queen d7, maybe bishop g7 makes more sense to look for moves like f5 and make sure knight d5 doesn't come with tempo. So if like knight d5 here... Again, queen d7 is the best move. But then you're kind of just retreating all your pieces. And then it's kind of my turn to attack with moves like d4. My opponent instead tried to keep the pressure on with knight to b4. And this I was very happy to see. And here there's only really one move for white to keep his advantage. So as we've done a few times in this video. And I hope that you like me doing this when I do remember. Instead of just accidentally showing you it. Find the move for white to, you know, try and build his advantage in this position. The move is queen f3. And the point is that it doesn't matter if the knight infiltrates. This is just a simple double attack. But it's also more than that, because after the bishop retreats, queen b7, you might get a bit scared about, I don't know, rook b8. But that's not scary, because you just take, and your queen is never getting trapped. Okay, what about knight c2? Yeah, that's also not scary, because I just attack your knight, and where is your knight going? Okay, well, knight d3. This is what my opponent played to attack my bishop. I just go bishop a3. And my idea was that if this knight tries to do anything, my bishop controls it. If it tries to retreat to a square like c5, I'm just going to snap it. This knight's coming to d5, your bishop is going to be comparatively terrible. And it's very difficult for black to actually move. Rook f to e8 is the best move. Like, what? What? That is not in the spirit of the position. You're just going to give up c7? Apparently this is the best line. And I don't see how you follow up. You're just down to three pawns even. And my position is solid. But he goes c5, which was odd. I go queen e4. I just bring the queen back and pressure the knight. And if the knight retreats to b4, I'm just going to snap, put the knight on d5, and b4 is weak. Let's say you play a5 to defend the b4 pawn. I'm not only up a pawn, but I can also play a move like d3 to be solid. I can play a3 to try and break through if I want. I can offer a queen trade on g2, and after your queen, probably not to there. Not to there either. Where can the queen go? g4. Okay, because it doesn't want to get forked, obviously. And the position is just nice for me. It's just a nice position. But my opponent goes queen f5, which I thought was actually quite a practical option. Because after the trade, it's actually quite difficult to kick this knight out of the position. But my opponent makes it easy, because after I go knight d5, because I think knight d5 is obviously the most natural move, I was half expecting e4 to try and attack my rook. But after knight e7, king h8, I figured I could just move the rook. And black actually has no threats, and my knight is really, really a problem. Because how are you defending f4? 
sorry, F5. The best move is apparently just to sack the pawn. And now I'm just up two pawns. And I have faith that I can convert this. But yeah, my opponent goes A5, and this just allows me to play knight E7. And my opponent resigns, because after king H8, knight F4, sorry, knight F5, I'm up two pawns. A4 isn't scary. E4 just locks this diagonal shut forever. And if you take, you're just giving me counterplay. If you try and target the B file, I can just defend the B file. Like, there is no problem. And maybe it's hard to configure my pieces, but if I place moves like king f1, king e2, this knight's going to get kicked out. Let's say king h8, king f1, I don't know, rook b7, king e2, knight b4. I'm just going to snap this off the board, most likely. Oh, d6 was hanging, by the way. Um, let's forget about that hanging. But I'm just going to snap this off the board. I can play moves like rook a6, and this position is going to become very difficult for black to try and hold. So my opponent resigned. Um, maybe unnecessary, but again, I just played normal moves. Yes, my light square bishop got traded, but still the position is just very, very solid. So yeah, hopefully that's encouraged some of you guys to look more into the English. I would encourage you just to try it, just play it without knowing theory. I would say go for this setup here with pawns on e3, g3, and c4, bishop on g2, knight on e2, knight on c3. I think it's so easy to play. You can be in Keto the dark squared bishop as well, but just take the positions as they come and please let me know how you get on with it. I'd be really interested to know. Maybe I'm just a freak case here where I enjoy the English and no one else does. But um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I will see you in the next one.